Welcome back. Good morning, Austin. This is our daily show from the running event presented by Boa Technologies. A big thank you to Boa for their support. My name is Dylan Bowman. And now we are joined by two legends of the game, the biggest OGs in at least the trail footwear game that I know of. Scott Tucker here, Scott McCubrey. Gentlemen, welcome to the running event. Thanks for coming over. Well, we're happy to be here. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks for having us. Hold the mic up a little higher. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So let's start, let's go back in time first before we talk about this super exciting new project. Maybe both of you just give a, a quick condensed version. I've, I've given you the, uh, the mantle of being two of the biggest OGs in the footwear game. So maybe just give a quick condensed history of your guys' history, just working on, on trail product, especially. Okay. Well, I'll begin. Uh, it was back in 1995 actually. And I, um, lucked into a part-time job at what was then one sport and being a runner from in college and so forth i uh i thought wow well this could be cool this is a hiking boot company but we really should be doing trail running shoes because you know that's the future and we should be lightweight and fast and you know all of those things and um the you know one sport was this little startup we uh, had just like open canvas to do stuff. And uh, even though I was just like this, you know, wet behind the ears kid out of business school at this new, you know, basically startup company, uh, they said, go for it, you know, design a shoe. And that shoe was the Vitesse. And that kind of, you know, got me into it. I got to go through the whole process, learn as I go. I knew nothing before I got into that. But it was like at the beginning of things. And, uh, you know, um, I got to, uh, you know, play with uh, with product and with um, folks who, you know, were maybe not legends yet, but were becoming legends, yep. you know? So, for example, Scott Jurek was one of our very first athletes. We should say one life. sport became Montreal. That's yes. right, that's yes. right. Yeah, one sport became Montreal. Um, and, uh, you know, we just uh, hit it off well with the with that first shoe. And, it, you know, we stuck with that shoe for, what, I don't know, like eight years that's or something like iconic, that. That's an iconic, iconic <laughs> piece of trail but, um, gear. But we yeah. just get, were able to build on it, and, we, you know, it was good timing because the sport was, you know, in its infancy, but it was growing, and we were kind of first kids on the block, and, uh, you know, that was just, like, the best education I could get, and I just had so much fun. Yeah. You've done a, a lot of other stuff, too, and I want to specifically talk about Pearl Izumi, which is where you and I first met, you know, more, about probably a dozen years ago, but... McCoober, you go next. Just yeah, take so us back to the beginning. It's yeah. a good segue into when Scott and I started working. I just came off of a 10 year, 10 years of working at Nordstrom, selling suits in Washington, D.C. in the 80s to the political crowd and moved back to Seattle um, and wanted to get into the outdoor industry and started working as a sales rep with a guy named Kurt Watkins, who happened to be um, one of Scott's cousins at the time, and we were repping K2 inline skates and some other outdoor stuff. But I had just started getting into running coming off of a ski racing background and was picking up a power bar and a, and a bottle of water and going deep into the Alpine Lakes wilderness by myself. You know, back at that time, it was not a lot of ultra runners um, hanging around Seattle area at the time. And um, then came across the Vitesse, when it was the One Sport Vitesse at the OR show and um, started talking to Scott and George Brown and we ended up, Kurt and I, becoming the One Sport reps in the Northwest. And I had kind of thrown myself completely into the ultra running scene, running White River in 95 and put together this little One Sport team up in the Northwest that included like Jim Kirby and Dave Terry and Rob Lang. And we had um, just started talking as a company to Ben Hyen and um, in the Northwest, the sales of the Vitesse like really excelled with this little ultra running team that mm. we had. And when Scott and George approached me about changing the name to Montreal, they're like, you know what you did in the Northwest? Can you do that in the rest of the country? And so I kind of became the 
the face of Montreal out there in creating this team-oriented marketing program that supported our sales reps regionally. Okay. And Scott was the brains behind it all and, and the one that was back there creating the shoes and then supporting everything I was doing. Um, and so we ended up working together for, I was there for about, just about six years um, before I opened Seattle Running Company. Okay. Yeah. So is it accurate to say that with this new project that you're the product guy, you're the sales guy, the two Scots. Okay, great. Yeah, it, okay. Yes. Awesome. We'll get to that here in a little bit. I wanted to come back to Pearl Izumi. Those iconic shoes. It was so funny. Billy Yang the other day posted a photo of me at Western States from 2014 wearing my Pearl Izumi ultra running team kit and just the comments were f still filled with people who just like remember those products that you created with so much affection. Maybe just, you know, remind people what we're talking about with the, uh, the running team at Pearl Izumi, the products that I'm referencing and maybe what part of that still sort of lives on in your memory. Right. Well, so the, uh, the Pearl Izumi, uh, shoe line, you know, when I, when I got there, their main focus was on the upper construction and like seamless uppers and like you know, that kind of comfort approach to it all. And I said, you know, there's this other part of the shoe that's like really important. <laughs> and we can create, I believe, a, you know, a much smoother ride um, if we shape it differently. Uh -huh. So kind of a rocker shape idea, but it was a uh, play on that theme to make it a smoother running shoe. And, you know, this was road as well as trail. Um, we, uh, but we, you know, executed it, I think really well in the, in the trail shoes and, um, you know, quickly got a following, which was, you know, it was really fantastic. And I um, uh, kept, you know, pairs of those shoes for years after I left. In fact, I, didn't wear any other trail shoes until I created these Vamazis. Really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you had yes. an inventory stash. Well, yeah, they were beaten up, but yes. You could probably sell those things like on <laughs> StockX for some ridiculous sum at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, it's funny that those shoes still live in the mind of the culture of people who were around at that time. Obviously, Timothy Olsen was iconic, winning Western States in the shoes, kind of the first year that they came out. And then he left Pearl Izumi and won Western States again, still wearing <laughs> the Pearl Izumi shoes. And I just think it's funny to be able to, you know, remind the audience that, that you were sort of the, the creator of that emotion platform that is still remembered with you know, remembered romantically and trail running lore. McCubrey, back to you. Uh, maybe say a few words about, you know, also as we talk about Pearl Izumi, Montreal has been like core to the culture of trail running since the very beginning too. What about that legacy and that, that history? Do you still remember fondly? And like what lives on now as we start to move towards talking about this latest project with Vamazi? I do remember it, of course. And mostly I remember the people that I was working with and then the team that we created. And, um, you know, I went on selling Montreal while Scott was still down there when I opened Seattle Running Company. and We had one of the largest Montreal businesses for a single store in the whole country. And the whole Montreal team had moved to Seattle to live together. They were sleeping on my floor, working at the store, and training together. And so we had Seattle Running Company for um, almost, a, well, for 11 years while um, Scott was finishing off his time at um, Montreal and before the Pearl Izumi thing happened. And we had Scott Jurek, Hal Kerner, Chrissy Mail, Brandon Sabrowski, Phil Kocek, um, Ian Torrance came up and we were all working together at Seattle Running Company. It's so funny. That's just like the Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer. No, they right all, it, it, I mean, in 2003, I was the manager for the World 100K team. And, you know, we had like three or four club members on the team and stuff going to Holland from, you know, and stuff like that. And then really got into putting on some events, including taking over White River 50, which became really the the beginning of national championships um, in 
year 2000, we had $10,000 in prize money. And nothing, it's unheard of even almost to this day to find a good race yep. with $10,000 in prize money. But with that crew working for me, you know, we were able to start coaching programs and weekly runs and um, put on events. And those guys were the ones helping me all do it, you know, as well as me supporting them in their, their running careers, so to speak, yeah. at that time. Um, and so that kind of Montreal legacy lived on with those people, um, even though Montreal had kind of gone away, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but meanwhile, Scott had actually had a little bit of a stay with Scott Sports. He was living over in Sun Valley with his son um, for the Nordic program over there. Mm -hmm. And he s came to me at Seattle Running Company with the Scott Sports shoe brand. And um, I was in the process of selling the store uh. at the time. And um, um, Scott picked me up as the Scott rep. So it was Scott and Scott at Scott. <laughs> and um, um, so... When Scott got his offer at um, Pearl Izumi yeah. to go to Boulder, I stepped into his role at Scott Sports. Okay. So that was another crossover that we had. And I wanted to live in Sun Valley since fourth grade. I grew up as a downhill ski racer. Okay. So that moved me to Ketchum, which I thank him for, yes. for, for getting my family over to, to the most amazing ski world you could imagine. Is Scott based in Ketchum? They were. So okay. Scott Sports was in Ketchum since 1956. They brought uh. the aluminum ski pole to the market. They were mainly a ski brand. Um, but they moved to Salt Lake and so they were in it, out of, in it in the U.S. They were out of it in the U.S. You know, they continued to stay steady in Europe with the shoes. Um, but it, you know, I was there for a while, then I was out, then I was back in. They didn't have the same commitment that Pearl yeah. Zumi had. So I had some effectiveness there. Um, and had quite the trail team there too, with Joe Gray yep. and Jody Adams Moore and Ian Alex Charman Nichols, and Alex, yeah. you know that whole crew. And Cody Lynn to this day yep. is still um, on contract out of Europe with those guys. Yeah. Um, but um, after Scott moved out of there, I ran the brand out of my house basically for four years or so. But the commitment to the U.S. market was was waning, yeah. and so I started doing some. I did some repping for Innovate. I managed a place called Smiley Creek Lodge with snowmobile guides and restaurant and these other things. Um, picked up a job at running the Elephant's Perch, one of the main shops in town. There, and that's when Scott approached me. Um, we had been talking about the Vamazi thing since he started it, but. Um, cool. Roundabout when they got inventory ready to go, I was working retail, which I swore I'd never go back to after 28 <laughs> years of working retail. And um, so Scott saved me again and brought me back into the shoe business here. So, so great. All right. Well, that brings us to present day. And I could be entertained by all this <laughs> history for hours, but we should spend uh, as much time as we can here on this latest project. So maybe just opening up the floor to you, Mr. Tucker, tell us about Vamazi, where the concept came from. We were just recollecting about when we bumped into each other on the Wildwood Trail in Portland and you shared with me this new concept for the first time. So maybe introduce it to the audience. Right. Well, you know, maybe, you know, kind of going back to Pearl Izumi and just to segue from there, you know, uh, we were doing some you know, good things with, you know, shaping of the midsole and so forth to get a good effect. But uh, maybe most people don't know that early on when we came out with the emotion line in the first year, um, the, the N2 came out and the um, durometer, the midsole, was too high and it was a complete fiasco because they just felt horrible. Mm. <laughs> and Does that mean they're too hard or they're too soft? They were too hard. Okay. Yeah. And, the, um, and it happened because... You know, playing with the densities of the midsole, like as um, uh, had been, you know, sort of, and is in a lot of the industry, kind of a uh, thumbnail test kind of mm -hmm. process. Like that's oh, a little too hard, or you know, that's a little too soft, kind of thing, which doesn't translate very well to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and you can get these wild swings, and. After I left Pearl Izumi, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, the, the fact that we 
we don't pay good enough attention to the to the densities mm. in the soul. Like we we kind of wing it in a sense. Like oh, I like it a little softer. Or, well, you know, that doesn't feel responsive, or that feels you know too mushy, or you know we we talk about it in those things. And I thought there's got to be a better way. <laughs> there's got to be a way to actually engineer it. And my idea was. Well, if you're going to engineer it to something, why don't you engineer it to the actual forces that you mm. create? Um, and so that, you know, started this deep dive into like, well, what are those actually? It's a big biomechanics kind of investigation. And nobody had actually come up with an answer before. So I was like, well, I guess I'll figure it out. And I did, uh, which is a whole different story. But the upshot is that I figured out how you can actually specify exactly what the density should be. You can mm. tell the manufacturer what to do. Um, but the biggest thing is that I discovered you can't do it with one density throughout the soul. If, you re if you're really going to do it right, you need um, what... I figured out was two different densities mm -hmm. in the soul. And it was the reverse of how we'd all been doing it in the industry before. Mm -hmm. We'd been doing a softer pad or, you know, something in the forefoot and more stability and structure in the heel. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the reverse of how the forces go. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get the kind of result. And so I flipped that paradigm. So we have a much softer rear foot and firmer forefoot, okay, so construction of it is, you know, you can see it simple yeah. here, but, but the question is, okay, so you're going to do that, but what is the specification? Sure. Exactly what they are. And that turned out to vary um, according to a lot of things. I mean, it varies by um, your cadence and your stride length and, it, and your weight and and how fast you go, and so forth. And so I started playing with those variables and say, how can I simplify this and make a product line out mm -hmm. of it? And that's what came up with this idea of, well, let's have a series of shoes, and we'll do it differently there, but we'll keep that basic idea that we're adjusting the midsole to the forces so that we can get, and here's the most important thing, so that we can get more cushioning at impact and without sacrificing the stability, you know, when you're pushing off. Yeah. So but talk about like the, the pace tuning, like it's because it feels like this is something that's really differentiated and a novel approach. And maybe if you want to use some of the props that you've brought to make it a little bit visual for our audience, I'd love to hear you expand on that a little bit. Right. Well, so the... Um, we focused in on talking about pace tuning, which is about, you know, how does it vary according to how fast you run? Mm -hmm. um, but as I just mentioned, you know, like there's a lot of variables there. Right. We just picked that one because we thought that's most familiar and people are going to get it and so forth. And we're going to be able to deliver this good product in a way that they can understand which one they need to get and so forth. Mm -hmm. But but the essence of it is really this balance of the two. Forces uh, of show the two, it to this camera here, the yeah. balance of the two different densities. Okay. Right. So it's not just any combination that's really going to work. Yeah. There's a there's a a good balance, and that has to do with exactly how our bodies work, and and that's consistent across people, <laughs> and genders, and and heights, and and weight okay. too. Yep. So we could just by maintaining this balance then you can deliver that better cushioning, better stability story in all of them. And when you put that into the shoe then and do all of the other things correctly as yeah, well, yeah. then you get this better, smoother, you know, less shock, more, you know, less torsional um, stress kind of experience. And that's our point of differentiation is that we're like, okay, well, we can actually up the ante because we can do both of these things simultaneously instead of trading off mm -hmm. between like, oh, well, it's really soft, but it's kind of mushy yeah. and unstable. Or it's nice and stable, but it's hard. 
So talk more about like the, that point of differentiation. Obviously, like we're here at TRE, there's going to be a million brands on the convention floor. And obviously you do need to stand out and be different, but that does require some sort of education to the customer or in this case, the retailers and other people in the industry. If you were to sort of condense down what you've just said to us, or maybe say a few words about like that education process, about like how you get your message out in the industry that you guys have both worked in for a million years. So I'm sure you have a lot of great connections, but ultimately you're trying to, to reach a, a consumer and tell them a new story. Anything you want to say about that from a, a marketing perspective and a brand perspective? Well, we think it's all captured really well. If you say yeah. this has a much better, smoother road to trail transition. Mm -hmm. Because that whole concept, like you're on the road, it's hard. You want something soft and smooth doing it, you know. But then you're in the trail and you need control and stability, you know, and so you're not going to wash out on the corners and, you know, those kinds of things. That captures these two basic things that we're trying to achieve in there. So that's, that's, um, I mean, that's, that's how... I pitch it, but like we got to talk to McCubri over here because he's the, <laughs> the sales guy. He like is the one that yeah. articulates it in a sales manner. So. Yeah. so I'm the one that's out meeting with the buyers and trying to take what Scott's done and then turn it into a sellable package and then train the employees on how to present it properly to, to the consumer when they come in. And um, the pace tuning aspect particularly related to the road running shoes, um, allow us to kind of quantify, you know, these these densities in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and for the long and the short of it, the faster shoes have firmer densities, but right. the same variable in this difference that Scott's talking about. Thank you, yeah. And um, so, you know, I kind of reframed it into the, the categories that people are used to hearing about, two racing flats, two lightweight trainers and two max cushion shoes. And now we have two trail running shoes and, you know, one's going to be a little firmer. One's going to be a little softer in each of those categories. And those are, you know, the faster pace versus the slower pace in each of those categories. And it could be a variety of things that that relate to whether you want the firmer densities or the softer densities. It could be you have a more flexible foot. You're going to like the firmer shoe. You could have a more rigid foot. You're going to like the softer densities but you're still in that lightweight training category. So you get to the trail running category. And what it does is it makes for this um, really amazing blend of cushioning that's never been there in that trail running category before Mm -hmm. and real stable, supportive, protective forefoot. Um, And so you get this uh, much, for lack of a better way to describe it, the the trail running shoes are going to feel much more like the transition of a really high performance road chip mm. which makes it this great dynamic when you're when you're actually running on dirt road and then you still get this very stable protective forefoot in the shoe um and you know you can really see it you gotta hold the working mic. as a, this softer heel range works as this this almost a, a shock absorption aspect conforming to the terrain and then as you roll forward you get this really stable feel to push off of when you're running through turns and when you're going over rocks and roots. And the dynamic of what Scott had done in the road shoes, when once we got these trail shoes out there now, and now that people are trying them, is that, oh my God, I've never run on a trail running shoe that has that smooth of mm-hmm. a transition and that stable of a forefoot on the shoe. And so we think we really have something here in the trail range, yeah. even though it started in this road range as a pace thing. And, you know, this is basically running off of that same concept I was talking about with two racing flats, two lightweight trainers, and two max cushion shoes for road. We have two trail running shoes on the same platform. One's a little firmer and more responsive in the densities, and the other one's a little more cushioned. Yep. And, um, you know, which is going to work a little better for a bigger person or longer runs longer or race, yeah. like that. And then now taking what we've done, what Scott had done in this more in this racing range, racing flat range for road and then applying it to a, a, a faster paced or um, firmer, more responsive yeah. trail running shoe for, for a third add on there. So, um, 
It's great. Yeah, super, so super that's interesting. that's kind of the way I try to get it presented. It's, it's, it is a challenge. It's one of yeah. the bigger challenges out there is, is to, to get the employees, the store employees, to yeah. understand what's inside the shoe and then how to present it. To them. Cool. And TRE is the perfect place to help with that education. I'd love to hear you guys talk about just like the process of building the business, like as people who've worked for big established brands in the past, you know, this seems like a very much an entrepreneurial thing. I think you've been working on this for years. I mean, I know it's, it's sort of new to market, but we bumped into each other in Forest Park probably three years ago. So maybe anything you want to say about Right, and even at that time, I'd been working on it for a couple of years. Really? Wow. Yeah, so it started in uh, 2018 yeah. um, was when I you know, really pulled the trigger on getting going yeah. um, and saying, well, we're going to have to raise some money. We're going to have to form a corporation. Yeah. We're going to have to just, you know, lay it out there and... And go for it. Yeah. Um, and was that your first time doing something like that? Uh, no, I'd uh, dipped my little toe in yeah. in the waters before, but you know, quickly yanked it back out again. <laughs> <laughs> this time, I I really you know stuck with it. We got enough other people enthusiastic about the whole idea and the prospects of coming to market with a, with a new concept in a, in a admittedly really crowded competitive yeah. field. So very cool though. Yeah. So maybe uh, let's talk about the commercialization element of it too, because, you know, Scott McCubrey has talked about educating the sales folks from the really important brick and mortar retailers that run specialty shops. There's going to be a lot of them here, but obviously also direct to consumer is a big thing now. So anything you want to share between the, the balance between D to C versus, you know, wholesaling and then also, you know, any of the initial feedback that you received because it's, it's only been launched now for how many months? Right. Right. Yeah. I know like half a year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Lots of learnings, yeah. of course, in this short period of time. And, you know, one of them with respect to um, D to C was that uh, we didn't, and I will, you know, take credit for this myself, I did not um, appreciate how, uh, you know, reluctant people actually are to buy a product they've never heard of before yeah. online, especially, you know, if it costs, you know, 170 bucks yeah. and, um, and it's footwear and you don't know how it feels. Um, so, so that is like a really big psychological barrier online with a new brand. And um, so we came into it thinking like, oh yeah, well, you know, online is like taking off and that's what's going to take over the world. And, you know, look, just look what's happened to Amazon, you know, sure. and that sort of thing. And real, and then came to fully understand that that is not actually how people behave for this kind of a product. And yeah. so we got to go and get the, get the shoes in front of consumers so they can try it on. Yeah. And we found out that the side by side comparison is our friend. Yeah. Um, cause that, you know, people feel it and they're like, Oh, well, these really are great. Okay. I get it. But if they haven't got that opportunity to put them on, well, they're not going to go down that road. Yeah. It, you still have to build the name yeah. through the brick and mortar retailers before yeah. you're going to get that attention online. And that's where, you know, that's when Scott quickly turned to me. I'm kind of known out there as the starter guy, right? <laughs> the guy that can get jump started or get the get new companies going or kind of thing. Yeah. From that perspective, and you know, five of my ex employees own stores. And they're all accounts now. Well, four of them. There's one that's not yeah. doesn't have a store still. But um, and so that's like Hal and Jonathan and Phil Kocheck. Yes, and those guys <laughs> have brought the brand in, and so those are where I step in for the brand building aspect mm -hmm. of it. Is is those relationships and um, with 23 years of retail in my po back pocket, you know, I understand what. It's happening a lot at that level, and so I, I can um, help get the the brand out there into the retail stores, and hopefully get the name built up. But it's it's going to take a little time yeah. for sure before it's all good things well do. Enough. Yeah. 
Well, guys, we could talk for ages about this, and maybe we'll do a round two or a longer form combo. We should start winding down now. But why don't you uh, tell people where they can learn more about Vamazi um, and any any other sort of products or things that you have coming down the pipeline? Well, you know, uh, as a startup with our limited resources, we haven't been out there canvassing the world with advertisements and yep. so forth. We rely heavily on on our um, PR, you know, and, and mentions and and yeah. and podcasts like this one to drive people into, you know, check out the the shoes on, online and then look for there to where you can get them. And um, the trail shoes, you know, only just arrived last month. So, I mean, I haven't hardly had any time even to make our first shipments to, yeah. uh, to retailers. Um, and so, we, you know, we have a lot of work to do to get it out there so that it's easily accessible to folks. And that's just beginning. And that's what this whole season is about mm -hmm. for us right now. But I would say, yeah, the, um, the, uh, in the Northwest, we've got it, you know, much better distributed because that's our home base yep. um, and we're working to get it, you know, elsewhere in the country, but that's, that's our starting point. Um, that, and, and then online to, to figure out where to. Is that Vomazi.com or? It is. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll make sure to include a link here at the end of the show. Any final words from you, Mr. McCubrey? Yeah, no, it just, you know, the, there's some really strong retailers out there right now that we have um, that include you know, Seven Hills Run Shop, Snoqualmie Valley Running, right. um, Hal's Store in Ashland. Rogue, Rogue Valley um, Runners. Ohio yeah. Valley Running Company, Pocatello Running Company. Nice. I could call them all out. Shoes Idaho Running Company. <laughs> and I don't want to miss anybody if, uh, yeah. if they're watching. But, you know, that's going to be the key aspect, um, particularly in the trail running side of it, is getting places where people can do demos and try the shoes. And so keep your eyes out. Yeah, sweet. Originally, as 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 we get more spots to go try them. Well, good luck, guys. I'm sure it's a, it's hard to create something out of nothing, but you know, if anybody has proven that they can make great trail product, especially, I can speak from experience that uh, you two very much can. Appreciate you guys coming on the show, and yeah, look forward to seeing the progress with Famazi. Thanks for having us. Yes. Great to see you again. Good to see you, Dylan. Thanks, guys.